So on the topic of KMS extensions, there's, well, it just more or less random stuff that for, for some of them we actually already, already discussed them. So I'm just going through the list. Uh, it's, well, hopefully it will be mostly small topics. Uh, the first one I want to discuss is the non-memory backed uh, pipeline sources. So at the moment <clears throat> in, in the KMS API when you have a CRTC, you can have a main frame buffer and you can have planes. And for both of them, the source is a memory object. <clears throat> and we, we also have hardware when instead of, uh, when instead of, uh, of getting the, the frames from memory, you can actually have deep pipeline the hardware. So you get, you, you get your frames from camera, from a codec, from a video processing engine, and they deep pipeline to, um, to the display without having a frame buffer in between, without having memory in between. So we need a way to, to support that in, uh, in KMS. Uh, <clears throat> I have a pretty simple one. Yeah, pretty simple use case, actually. Um, this is my display engine. So <clears throat> it has three CRTCs, uh, three outputs on the top, uh, 0, 1, and 2. Uh, <clears throat> there's uh, two of them are connected. Uh, I got a VGA DAC, a VGA connector, and I got uh, a parallel panel. So it's pretty simple. Then <clears throat> in, the same, in the same piece of hardware, I have a video processing engine. That's much more complex, but basically it's, it goes from memory on the top uh, in yellow and to, uh, all the way to memory on the bottom in yellow as well. Uh, there's actually a couple of missing blocks in the middle. But there's, uh, there's a small option right over here that you can use to, to take the output of a pipeline and <laughs> this goes right to the display. So, yep. So that, that's, that's a video processing engine. So if you look uh, in the middle, for example, you have the UDS, that's the um, upscale, downscale scaler. Uh, you have read formatters, uh, write formatters that do uh, format conversion. Um, and uh, there's a, it's not displayed here because it's not implemented yet, but there's a blending engine as well, a composer in the middle. So that, that's a single piece of hardware. It's different IP blocks, but a single device inside the SOC. And the output can actually go straight to the display over here. So I currently have two drivers. I get a video for Linux driver that goes from memory to memory uh, for this piece of hardware. And I also have a KMS driver for, for the display. But there's a, at the moment no link between the two. So there's, there's, a link there's a link missing between the output of my video processing engine and the input of my display. Um, we need a way to model that in KMS. One, one idea I had, that's something I've implemented but not, not posted to mailing lists yet, is to create a new kind of object in KMS that would be a DRM live source object. And a live source could be passed uh, to the plain API, to, well, to the CRTC API, instead of an FB ID. So at the moment, the, at the moment we, the API we have that take an FB, uh, an FB ID would just transparently uh, take a live source ID. Inside the driver, you would just, uh, or actually inside uh, the KMS call, you would, based on the ID, we would check whether it's a live source or whether it's a frame buffer and call the right function in, in the CRDC for setting the plane or setting the mode. So that's pretty simple uh, on the KMS side. It's a pretty sim simple extension. There's a couple of new IO controls. So uh, there's a new, one new object, and there's a couple of new IO controls to, uh, to be able to uh, enumerate the properties of that object and get information about those objects. Um, <clears throat> what will still be missing is actually the link between the two devices, because at the moment, even with that extension, I have to configure on the KMS side the size of the frames I will get from the video processing engine. And we'll have to configure the video processing engine using the video Linux API on the other side. And the two sizes need to match, obviously. And if they don't, well, I could, I could get garbage on the screen or if, uh, yeah. even so crashes. A, a DRM frame buffer object has all of the properties of the size and format and yes. so on. Yes. So I mean, I've, I've kind of envisioned this use case as a special sort of frame buffer where the live source is a more or less special kind of frame buffer. So you don't, right. you don't create it at runtime because there's a limited set of live sources. Live sources. Sure. they created by the driver. But they more or less act as a frame buffer. Right. But I mean, if they still hold all the properties of the size and format and, yes, and they so do. on. So that, that kind of, yeah, that kind of communicates the information you need from one side to the other. 
about what what the size of the image is, what's the pitch, what's how many we ha planes. We, we like have information on both sides. So this is handled by a video phonics driver. It's uh, it's one device, and you got a display device that's handled by a KMS driver. But there's no communication between the two drivers. So at the moment, user space needs to configure both sides with the same configuration, the same frame size. Yeah, well, but I mean, they don't, they don't actually necessarily need to be the same. I mean, some hardware like uh, Intel stuff and I think some of the other desktop drivers can have like panel fitters so they can take a smaller buffer and fit it yeah, but to the space. I mean, you still want to scan in. Yep. The, the, the CRTC has to be configured. You get CRTC registers that you need to configure with the size of the incoming frame, right? Uh, well, not necessarily. Yeah, it, yeah, yeah, yeah. But you still, you still need to tell the hardware about the size of the incoming frame, even if it's, if it's different from the mode. So, so presumably, you've also got to handle the case where that size changes quite often. That as well. Yeah. Yes. Especially get this. This sort of idea of video decoders with direct paths is relatively common in set-top box chips. So that's where you do get size changes every time you get to commercial break or back into the main program. So you potentially change the size of this. Yep. And you don't ever want to show a blank frame or some garbage in between the transition. So you've got to, have, you've got to be relatively sure about how your signaling is going to work. Yeah, that's an extension of the problem I was envisioning, but that's definitely, uh, that's definitely a valid point. But the thing is, we need, we need to synchronize the two drivers at some point. If we don't, well, that's left to user space, and it works at the moment. But if user space decides to configure a different size at the output of the processing engine and the input of the, the display, then you can have garbage on the screen in the best case, or you could even have a harder crash, uh, which is pretty bad. I mean. In some sense, this sort of use case, you're going to have a custom user space anyways. So yes. I worry less about handling it generically. And I wouldn't I mean, worry about communicating the information between the two drivers so that they would automatically configure themselves. But what worries me that uh, what I would like to have is a way for the drivers to just check that the size matches. Sure. Um, but I mean, in some sense, that's analogous to the checking that already happens when you pass in a frame buffer object and attach it to a CRTC or a, a right. plane. Right, yeah. Um, so. so you think that having a live source object that would have a side line, like a frame buffer, uh, should be enough without communication between the two drivers, at least well, for now? I mean, there's going to end up having to be some communication under the hood, especially to deal with cases where there's size changes. Yeah, if you need to, to change the size at runtime, then you probably need to communicate between the two. Yeah, I mean, but as a first step, we could possibly just add a live source object to KMS right. and then extend that I mean, later. I'm, I'm less concerned about that sort of, I mean, the sort of cases I'm more concerned about are, you know, for Linux desktop, we have people who run like really old user space with a new kernel or yep. vice versa. Um, you know, that's, it, you don't have to worry so much about that sort of use case for these sort of devices. So having to do something custom with some under the hood communication or whatever you need doesn't scare me as much. Um, but, uh. Uh, I, I'm, I'm a little bit, one thing that I've noticed uh, today actually in these discussions and before as well, custom solutions should scare you. These things, these types of devices, they are now, I'm not going to say rare, they're, they're not all that common, but they will be in the future. Hardware, hardware designers see input and output and all these video pipelines as one thing. Uh, uh, currently in the kernel, there are two things, historically. But we do need to come to a much more closer cooperation between the two, because hardware designers, they don't care. They just go on designing things as they do. They just see it as one big pipeline where video is going from one place to another and graphics and whatever. Uh, 
just keeping on making custom solutions, oh, a new piece of hardware comes on, oh, we, we fix it up quickly, we make a custom myoctal or whatever, and hey, it's working again. Yeah, but tomorrow there's yet another piece of hardware, this thing's slightly different. other things that we do need to spend time on that affects a lot more classes of hardware, desktop and embedded, and it affects Android user space and Wayland user space and so on. Um, so I'm not saying that shouldn't be solved. I'm just saying it's less critical from a point of view. Like some of the other issues like dealing with uh, atomic updates, mul multiple overlays and so on, we need to for desktop Linux, we really need to solve in a way that is backwards compatible with existing user space. This isn't stuff that's, you know, this sort of stuff is not really supported upstream currently, so we don't have those constraints. It's a less tricky problem to solve. Sorry? Right. <laughs> that's, yeah. Okay. So a summary for this one, <clears throat> Rob, you believe that the two steps approach would be good, one that would just be simple and add a new live source object to DRM and then later find a way to make the drivers talk to each other? I, I think so. I mean, it's honestly okay. something I've given less thought to, but um, okay. But it's but it might be something, th that's something we should keep in mind when designing things like atomic updates, for instance. Right. I mean, I, I'm much more worried about solving how we make KMS deal with uh, compositors that can use overlays and so on. Because yeah. We need to solve that, and we need to solve that in a backwards compatible way because of our user space kernel uh, okay. compatibility constraints. Next one, then. Uh, memory write back. So we get display engines that can actually write back the composited frame to memory instead of sending it to the display. And we don't have an API in KMS to capture that frame. Uh, one possibility here is to use the video for Linux API because that gear towards video capture. So a KMS driver would also create a video for Linux device node. That application could just use the video for Linux API to capture the output of the, of the display. Right. Any comments? So uh, a lot of our I've dealt with, if you want to write back to memory, it's literally you flip one byte somewhere to say yes. the primary physical display, you do write to memory and give it an address. Yeah. And my concern is that the requirement to use that is now you must also have a D4L2 API. Vendors aren't going to do that. They're going to write drivers where they have some kind of run around to set up the video capture. Yeah, the thing is, we need an API between user space and kernel space yeah, to yeah, pass buffers around, around, for instance. So KMS, KMS you, you, we have a memory management API in KMS that can be used to pass buffers to the display, but not to get data back from the display. Right. What I'm saying is that if the requirement to do that is you add a V4L2 API on top of your KMS driver. Yes. People who are, people who are under time constraints or want to shift devices get the choice between adding a V4L2 API or add a private dioxyl. They're probably going to pick the private dioxyl. Yeah, but so I mean, it's a matter of what, making what else it easy could we do? to do the right thing. I mean, if well, for what what what's what's the other solution? I don't know. I'm just saying that I don't think V4L2 is the right approach. In this well, from yeah, from, from from a user's from a user's. Yeah, but I mean, we have help. Yeah, it's pretty simple. Yeah. Yeah. So, a, a good analogy it, we have now in KMS the um, what are the, the DMA helpers for making it easy to create a simple driver that does contiguous. We could have write back helpers. If we have write back helpers, that seems. You know, especially if we have multiple different hardwares that have this feature, let's add some helpers, make it easy for driver writers to do the right thing. I mean, from a user space perspective, I think V4L is the right API. You want to be able to hook up, like, say, a GStreamer pipeline with V4L source and encoder and, you know, a network streaming sync, for example, to stream that out over the network. So 
V4L is the API user space wants to see. Um, the rest is how do we make helpers to make mm. uh, it easy for driver writers to do the right thing. So the right but the use case is uh, Wi-Fi display. Yeah. Right, but, but I mean, for Wi-Fi mirroring, it's... Yeah. And that you want to write out to memory and then encode with a V4L2 mem to mem encoder, right. for which so there are so drivers that exist. If you output that to a chunk of memory using the V4L2 API, then it's very, very easy to then hook that straight up into your V4L2 video encoder, which is exactly what you want to do. And even on Android, you know, a lot of the, the uh, codecs, although they're, they're IM, uh, Impact Max IMX like in user space, they pump through to a V4L2 API in kernel. Yeah, I mean, the way I kind of see Wi-Fi display is from a display side, it looks like a different encoder. So when you're configuring, you know, XR and R multiple monitor configuration, it looks like just another display. And then you fire off a daemon process that's dequeuing buffers from the V4L side of that, pumping those into your encoder, and then your network streaming sync. Um, yeah. Um, next one, chain composers. <clears throat> so CRDC at the moment KMS using planes uh, act as a bleacher, as a composer. Uh, we have hardware where we actually have like two stages. So we have a composer that takes several planes, and the output of that composer is actually one plane for, for the second stage composer, which is the CRDC. How can we support that? So does, does the composer actually look like a CRTC, or is it a different block? I mean, is that a it 2D blitter? Well, the CRDC, or, the CRDC is more or less a 2D blitter as well. Yeah, it is kind of a, a special case of yeah. subset of 2D blitter, I suppose. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I mean, I guess on that make a proposal, <laughs> uh, I, I don't have any ideas offhand. No ideas? Well, CDF is more about the output side of the pipeline after the CRDC. It doesn't really touch the CRDC itself because then you have memory objects involved and that's really the role of, of KMS. And, well, CDF is another topic, actually. <laughs> okay, so... Um, Nonlinear pipelines, multiple encoders. That's actually something we discussed yesterday. Sorry? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. The, the last one is for you. The last one is for you. <coughs> yes. Oh, does it have anything to do with this chain composer, or might it have anything to do? It with might this? actually, because <clears throat> we have two APIs for composers at the moment. We can do that with Video for Linux, and we have hardware that goes from memory to memory, and that can do more or less composing and blitting. And we have Video for Linux drivers for those. Uh, we also have KMS drivers in which the CRTC is a composer as well. So we actually have two use space APIs that can support pretty much the same the same type of hardware. So it's pretty unclear in which direction we should go in the future and whether we should try to converge between the two. 
So we, uh, we used on the Nexus 10, uh, the 2D Blitter and Composer uh, had a video for Linux interface. And the inability to change sort of stream parameters while it's streaming um, meant that there was a lot of like boilerplate overhead of like stop stream, configure, start stream, wait for stream to be done, stop stream, configure. Okay, so, so, <laughs> so if there is a way of like here's a frame with some streaming parameters and then that comes out and here's a frame, right. that would be a lot easier. So about that, that, that's the topic we actually discussed in the past in video for Linux. Uh, and it's, it's pretty big actually. So we decided to postpone implementation until we had real use cases and vendors asking us to do that because they had, they had a use case for that. So if you do, then that's definitely something we can, we can work on. So once upon a time, there was going to be some hardware with something that looked like a duplicated display controller block that did memory to memory. Yeah. But it had a sort of sequencer which lets you queue up operations. So in that regard, it looks more like a 2D blitter. And that's what you want. You want to be able to queue things up, keep the hardware busy, if the hardware supports it. If not, you emulate the queue with the worker thread yeah. or something in the kernel. Yeah, you just want to be able to change parameters. Right. Right. I mean, it's. Right. Right. So you want to make it look more like a GPU than a camera. <laughs> well, yeah, but I mean, you know, you, you, you got you to keep things pipeline, you got to keep the hardware busy, yep. the right way to do it. Yeah, it's, it's usually fixed pipeline, right? Um, well, not necessarily. I mean, in this case, you could reconfigure it at, at uh, you know, when it's done with one blit or a part of one blit, you can reconfigure it, okay. sequence right. that. Okay, so you have to sequence it, right. 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 Or large blitz, you might have to be splitting up into smaller parts mm. and sequence them all. But se sequencing would be handled in user space, right? Uh, no, building up a sequence of commands would be done in user space. Yes, yeah, exactly. But the transition from command one to command that, that's two in kernel to command space. three yes. is well, either in the kernel or in the, or in the hardware. In the hardware. So. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. So we have more work to do in uh, NVIDIA for Linux for per frame parameters. Zach? Just very quick, uh, if you're running into, you want to use video for Linux and you run into a problem, something that's not properly supported, please contact the Linux media mailing list. We can't fix it if nobody asks us. This particular example, it has been discussed. The only reason it's not in, it's a fair amount of work and you're not going to do it unless you have hardware that really needs it. But, you know, when we, ha when we have that, then we would be more than happy to start implementing this. But if nobody asks, so just contact us, please. Okay, uh, two topics left. Nonlinear non pipeline, so two CRTCs driving is the same display, for instance, uh, one CRTC being split across multiple displays. Uh, that's actually something ADF targets, right? Okay, so maybe we should actually merge that with the follow-up on the ADF discussion. So I think that the question there is how to The question there is how to handle that in, um, in KMS. And we had some kind of hand-wavy answer of, well, maybe we can hook two CRTCs up to one encoder. Yes. I think we didn't really understand the hardware well enough to say if that's really the right way or not. But, um, mm. but yeah, I mean, we somehow need to come up with a way to, to handle that. Okay, um, that, that requires more discussion, definitely. Yeah, I mean, right now it's yeah. hand wavy. Um, well, you can keep the magden. Root plane that doesn't span the yeah. whole display. So the nice thing uh, of all the things that Android and really Weston needs, this is the very easiest one. Um, all we really need, to, so initially I was calling it private planes because a bunch of hardware, what the, is looked at as a CRTC in KMS is really a plane plus a CRTC. Um, so a couple of the drivers that exist actually use a plane internally in the, the yeah. CRTC. 
we just need to expose that to user space. So plane already has uh, like a bit mask of which encode, uh, which CRTCs you can connect it to. For hardware, which really is more like what a CRTC traditionally was, where it's scan out plus stuff, um, that's fine. You have a primary plane that can only be attached to that one CRTC. Um, so we just need to add to the get plane resources ioctl an array of private planes. What about um, the mode setting API? You can really have to pass a frame buffer. It will span the whole display, right? Right. Well, well, except for like panel fitters, but um, the the way I have in mind, the, what I have in mind for how that will work is if a user old user space does a mode set where they attach an FB to a CRTC. Internally, the helpers route that to a, uh, the primary plane. And right, but I mean, <coughs> that scaling, FB right? is supposed in the KMS API to span the whole display. Sure. And if, if you want using, it to be if, smaller, how do you do that? If you're using the legacy API, that's what happens. OK, so if you, you're using you, the new API. Where with the new API, the you would not buffer. use the mode set uh, control. Um, well, you would use the atomic mode set, where you're attaching okay. the frame buffer right. as a property on the plane, okay. not on the CRTC. Yeah, that makes sense. Could you not just be able to pass null as the FB onto the CRTC and say, well, it, there is no buffer on this, and then you only have the planes? Um, you could. I, I mean, I, I would lean towards solving this as part of the atomic mode set, just so we don't have an extra intermediate user space mm. API state. Um, yeah, I pretty much agree with that. I mean, everything is a plane in that case. And then the case where you actually have a real root frame buffer, that's a special case with a, like a private plane. Right. I mean, one of the, you know, like I mentioned earlier, one of the constraints we have to deal with with KMS is, is backwards compatibility. So if we, yep. if we make those two <clears throat> changes at once, or if we make that change on, on top of atomic mode set, it, uh, reduces the different sort of cases that user space can do that we have to worry about going forward. Like every time we make a change, we have to think, okay, well, what about user space from this time period? Okay, what about user space from that time period? Yeah. Okay. So we've covered, um, Greg, you had brought up some stuff about the uh, about PMS in the context of the, uh, the uh, ADF. Yeah, I mean, the, the way X works with the separation of the window manager and the display server makes it really difficult to do overlays properly. So we're not really, we don't, I mean, I, ex, I expect X will probably use atomic mode set just for mode setting and not for page flipping. I mean, we have use cases where we need that for uh, constraints about driving multiple monitors. I mean, for example, this laptop can drive three displays, but it can only drive three displays if two of the displays have the same pixel clock. Um, we don't have a good way to express that with the current 
mode set API, which is working independently for each CRTC. But I, I don't care about overlays for X. That's, it's just not worth the pain. I, for that, I'm more thinking of Wayland. Um, yeah. Something that hasn't been brought up of uh, the difference between a philosophy sort of between ADF and the atomic mode set is that uh, ADF, every frame, you give a fully specified set of information about the display. Um, and in our opinion, oh well, and so, and then with the atomic mode set, it's basically a bunch of deltas. Um, and so it's sort of transactional in nature. Well, but, but, but even a full set is just, it's a full set because you've given it a full set. And so, right, and, and, and so I, I, I mean, I don't know of any display subsystem that doesn't need a fully specified set of information. And the composer itself has a fully specified set of information. And so one of, one of, one of the, the frustrations of trying to use the KMS API was you had to go in your composer, take your fully specified uh, state of the display, somehow diff that against the previous state, like do a set of changes uh, to marshal that into the KMS API, and then in your driver, you would have to copy your current state and then sort of do these updates and like have a fallback path um, and it was just a lot of extra overhead for. Um, we did have the idea of okay, some of the larger uh, parts of the state, like the um, the um, mode display timings, maybe we split those out into reference counted objects. So, uh, so it's just a pointer copy rather than a deep copy, but. If you look at the way Weston works, it actually respecifies most everything, every frame. The, uh, the, except, the exception might be things like, you know, color space conversion matrix. Maybe you don't specify that every frame. But most of the basic, like I have these planes and they're this X, Y width height and so on, ends up getting respecified, although. Right. Or yeah. look up to, yeah. I mean, the amount of data you're talking, you can't um, Yeah, but on, on some, hard, on some, it's not really about passing the data to the kernel, it's about also programming the hardware, so some hardware can actually be pretty slow. All right. Yeah. Sh sh presumably, mode set as well, you know, that's quite a heavyweight operation, and, um, you're not always going to be read mode setting, re resetting up all of your encoders and everything every single time you want to flip a buffer. So what, what is in that composition? Is it the, a list of planes? Maybe just a minor aside. Um, one thing I want for for KMS is the ability for a generic user space to work. I mean, not precluding a specific user space that can take better advantage of the hardware. Um, with the ADF approach, as far as I can tell, you basically require a specific user space. Um,
splash screen. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Just as far as the concern for that one. Yeah, it does it, it, I guess it, basically the concern is for, from Andrew's perspective, it was a, a, a problem. No, in fact, as Greg was saying, ADM design so that we can back. Okay, so from Android's point of view, uh, there's no problem with getting rid of FB I mean, I mean, I mean, if we have a solution, obviously. Yes, yeah, so, so the, the, like I said, Android, because it doesn't specify anything about the display, you know, it, it, it basically there's like Alex says, here's your buffer, can you get them on the display, and the ones that you can do it, and the ones that you can is it, 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 you know, GPU compose, and then you put on the display. Um, the one place that Android actually directly references FB is in this big UI thing, which mm. is a Small library we have to solve for rendering for the other other consoles. I don't know how bad it, if vendors actually required to ship that or not. No. Um, um, and, and so well, I, I, I think in order for like the updates to work, you have to use that. But but there's nothing like there's it, nothing as part of the Android like certification that requires that to be back with that Yeah. So so our, a vendor our, today can go back that to KMS. Okay. And, I have done an ADM back version of. Yes. Yeah, that was, that was previous version, so that was based on Gradlock instead of how the composer. Uh, and it was Gradlock implementation based on KMS. And I also had to fix the uh, init process because that what would that would reference FBDev directly. For the slash string. Uh, and it was <clears throat> just displaying a splash screen, and it was going to the FBDF API directly. That should not happen. Like, that should be going through the hardware closer. That was that, 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 last year. Yeah, that was last year. Yeah. So it might have changed since. Okay, that's good. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. So in general, I would say uh, to kill FBDev, you need to provide a viable alternative. Right. And just say, so, I mean, Android, yeah, so a lot of the Android devices, they are FB dev, um, but they're not really. If you look at the custom IOP tools that they <laughs> expose, um, they're nothing like FB dev at all, yeah. um, or at least the standard IOP tools. And so, um, okay, so Android may not require a, a FB dev. The vendors are going to continue doing FB dev implementations because it's the quickest way to do things. So if you really want to kill FB dev, then make the alternative easier and less work to implement. And then the vendors and the bean counters will say, we'll do it that way. Yeah, my word is the alternative. Is if, if, if we present the alternative, it is harder to implement than FB dev. And what they will do is because they're basically using FB dev for nothing, they will just not use FB dev. And everything will be a fire by Apple to just a device code instead of FB dev. Mm. Yeah. Uh, I, will, I will say from time to time I hear people complaining about FBDev broken on Android devices mostly because I think most vendors don't really use FBDev for much. Um, well, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm talking, these are like people who do like board bring up and they have like test tools that put a pattern using FBDev API. Um, yeah, so I mean, it, it is kind of nice to have the FBDev uh, compatibility layer in KMS, for example, because you know right now it's not too hard to include FBDev backwards compatibility for user space if you want, or not oh, include it if you don't. Oh dear. <laughs> yeah. Anyways. <laughs> I, I mean the uh, the other option is well we actually have 
tools that will do that sort of thing with KMS. Like there's like mode test in libdrm. Yep. I, that's what I usually point people to. Hey, go use that. Um, anyways. Mm. So do we have any non-Android blockers for getting rid of FB dev? I mean, we, we got FB con at the moment, but there's work on replacing that. David, maybe? Okay. Okay, so <clears throat> what kind of time frame are you looking at to upstream? Are there, are there any blocker? Do you see any problem? Oh, yeah, come to the front. <laughs> So what kind of time frame do you see for upstreaming that? Are the people pushing back? Is there still root problems to solve? Or? The problem is basically the, the WeChi subsystem, because we yes. still use it a lot. Um, but you can disable it. Or, well, you can disable FBDEF, and you disable FBCon, you use the dummy, um, dummy console. And then you can run your X server, but you don't get any graphical console. Right. Um, we have user space consoles which can replace it, like, mm -hmm. if, uh, well, you cannot use FBCon, but KMSCon, and, yeah, everything is working. Okay, what's, what's the upstream status of KMS log? Well, it's DRM log, but... Yeah, yeah sorry. <laughs> um, it's working, um, there's still some locking issues, but I guess I will post it to the mailing list in the next month. Great. I said, I, I mean, well, David probably knows better, but I think most of the pain is just VT switching. Yeah, but the thing with, <laughs> with VT switching is you can uh, enable it with a dummy console, so it works. It's just non-graphical. So. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. 